Welcome to Rebelthon 2021. I am Kevin Johnson from the Great Lakes Base, and it is my honor to be interviewing Brian Herring, who is a lead puppeteer of BB-8. Mr. Herring, thank you for being here with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Hope you're all doing very well and you're all having a safe time of it. How are you? Good, good. Being as safe as we can. Um, so the first question I got for you, um, I think this is on everybody's mind and, and we've all had that one moment. When is it that you realize that you became a Star Wars fan? Uh, well, when I first saw it, I, I was, um, I'm old enough to uh, have seen it the first time round when it was just called Star Wars and before, you know, episode four was even a thing. And my dad took myself and my brother, <clears throat> I was seven years old, I think, and um, just, just blew me away. And I became utterly obsessed with the whole thing. Um, I was, oh, I've said this before, I was that kid. I had the, 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 the slippers and the curtains and the bed sheets and the toys, still got all my toys. And uh, it just, I was just utterly obsessed with it. And I, I got a report card come home from school when I was around 10 years old that just said Brian's obsession with Star Wars will lead him nowhere and he should concentrate on his academic studies, um, which I didn't and it did. But that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's not a recommendation for life, kids. <laughs> It didn't lead you anywhere, but here you are, the lead puppeteer for BB-8. Well, there you go. It got me. It got me somewhere. It was worth something at the time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, being a puppeteer, what led you into that into that field? Um, well, it was never a thing I considered doing. I, I mean, I, I grew up like <clears throat> many people of my sort of generation on the Muppets, but it was not something I figured that would ever be a job for me. I was working as an actor and a stand-up. I did a lot of work in theatre and both sort of on stage and behind the scenes. And then I met a guy in a pub. My parents ran a country pub and a guy who worked, uh, who came into the pub, his son worked on a TV show called Spitting Image, which was a satirical puppet show in the eighties and nineties. And has now since come back quite recently. And um, he said, oh, you know, you come along to a, a workshop. I thought it was a training workshop. It turned out it was an audition. I'd never done any puppet work before. I, I did. I told them a lie at the audition. I said I'd worked on a, a tour of Little Shop of Horrors, uh, which was true because it had come through my local theatre and I worked on it as a member of the crew. And um, I sort of watched the guy doing the plant and they said, oh, it's very different to that. You've got TV monitors and you've got to listen to the track and you have to lip sync along with it. And, and they, they, they saw me for it. And six weeks later, they took me on as an apprentice puppeteer. And I've been doing that ever since. So since about 1992, so nearly 30 years now um that just sort of led me into it and and i've never looked back really oh wow that's that is very interesting <laughs> I found out that you're going to be working on the force react uh for the force awakens what was your reaction well <clears throat> it was a it was a strange thing because when i went into puppetry and said oh i'm gonna make you try and make a career out of this there were three things i wanted to do i would like to work with the muppets which I did fairly early on. I worked on Muppets Treasure Island. I would like to write a, a, TV, a, a TV show with a character on it that I perform, and I did that quite early on as well for the BBC. And I'd like to work on a Star Wars movie. And that was around about 1995. Um, and the prequels, I think, when did the prequels come out? That was, when uh, did they come 90, out? 99? 99, yes. Yeah, and I almost worked, um, a uh, great puppeteer friend of mine, Phil Eason, who uh, performed Yaddle in the um, in the Phantom Menace, who um, very sadly passed away quite recently. Um, he was trying to get me on as his other arm for uh, for Yaddle, but it didn't end up happening. So I missed my Star Wars window, and I was like, "Oh well, you know, that's two out of three ain't bad," as Meat Loaf once said. Um, and so I was kind of thinking, well, you know what else could I work on? And I, I started working on various movies. I got to work on Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and I did Prometheus. So I thought, well, you know, an alien movie, that's pretty cool. And then Star Wars sort of came back into our lives after, you know, the Lucasfilm, you know, was bought up by Disney. And um, I wound up speaking to Neil Scanlon, who I didn't realise at the time was going to be the head of the creature shop. And he brought me on board to be the, um, the the puppetry consultant on that film. And so we started, I started on that very early on. Um, I was on there from the July of 2013. So I did about 16 months on that job. And uh, it was a strange one because you went in early on 
and they were all pictures of like like the new the new stormtroopers and Chewbacca and people designing these new aliens and vehicles, and it was like Star Wars but not quite Star Wars, so it was all slightly different. And then we started doing various bits of rehearsal and everything was like Star Wars but still not quite Star Wars. And then we started we started working with BB-8 and various bits and pieces, and then we went off and started filming and we went out to the desert and there were speeders and evaporators and everything, and it was really like Star Wars but still not quite Star Wars. Came back to London, started working with the stormtroopers and the big black shiny floors and the driving mouse droids around, and it was still like Star Wars, but not quite Star Wars. And then we started working on M Stage, which is the inside of the Millennium Falcon. And it was BB-8 and uh, Daisy and John, uh, Ray and Finn for a couple of weeks, and it was really like Star Wars, but still not quite like Star Wars. And then Harrison Ford came to work. And I remember him first appearing coming up the the, um, the ramp of the Millennium Falcon with his big hairy friend and I was staring in, went wearing my wonderful green onesie that I have to wear when I'm puppeteering the rock version of BB-8 and he was wearing his full hand solo outfit and he looked me up and down and just went who picked that look and just walked off and I'm like oh great he just met one of my icons and he just sort of <laughs> just, you know had a good laugh at what I was wearing and then we started working and we and, and, and JJ was like, okay, so Han's gonna do this and then bb is gonna be here. And, and about halfway through that scene, I suddenly went, oh, I'm in a Star Wars movie. Because it was Han and Chewie and the Falcon and that was when it really landed. And, and it was quite a big deal then. You know, I had a bit of a wobble and just sort of thought, oh, this is it, how did this happen? But once you get over that, you just get on with it and you chip away it. You know, it's such a big thing to be involved in. You just sort of take it, you know, it's like how do you eat an elephant? It's one, one bite at a time. You know, it's you just do it day to day to day to day. And um, it was an amazing experience. And, and you know, will be always one of my, you know, one of my fondest memories of being involved in something like that. And especially having been a fan for so long to actually get to work. Because it was disappointing not to be able to work on the prequels. But actually what was great was I get I got to come and do Star Wars with the Falcon and Han and Chewie and Leia and Luke and C-3PO and R2-D2. So it was much more, it, it felt, emotionally it was much more, um, it resonated with me more, you know. Well, you, so you got to live just about everybody's Star Wars, exactly. every Star Wars fan's dream on mm. that. That is, that is a great story. Yeah. I, I know one thing, uh, everybody, I know my initial reaction when I first saw BB-8 was, wow, what is that? I, what was your reaction when you first saw BB-8? Well, I saw B- the first time I saw BB-8, he was, he was already concept drawings. So, you know, we had this little secret for nearly two years that, you know, we, 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 we had BB-8. It was a group of us, that, like that, the crew of that film. We, we had a, 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 a secret that no one else knew until they dropped that trailer and everybody did what you did and went, wow, that's, what, what is that? That's not real. That's got to be CGI. Um, and so, you know, it was interesting watching it evolve from like the very early drawings that Christian Altsman did and then it came over to London and, and Jake Lunt Davis sort of finished it off and made it look like the one behind you. And we kind of saw his face move around and the, the positioning of the, the, sort of the eye changed and you know, the panels were, were, were they changed. And it, and it was just, it was interesting evolution. So by the time he got to actually work with BBA, it was, he was already a fully formed thing. So what I thought was interesting about him though, was that, and it's a real testament to the design, is that you feel like you'd seen him before, even though you'd never seen him before, because he looks like an evolution of R2-D2. And that's just brilliance in design because it, it fits straight into the Star Wars universe. And that was where, you know, the guys who designed this stuff for the creature department and for all the other departments, you know, they, they, Star Wars has a certain aesthetic that they have to, you know, really adhere to. And I felt that a lot of the stuff, the creatures and the, the costumes and all the, the, the vehicles, they really looked like Star Wars stuff to me. Wow. How, uh, how did you uh, develop bb 8s personality? How did you bring him to life? What was your thought process on that? Well, um, there are lots of different versions of BB-8. And, uh, and I think it's important to note at this point that although I'm sitting here talking to you now, I'm a member of a very large team of people that, you know, have all worked to bring BB-8 to life from, from design through, you know, practical manufacture, programming, and then performance, and then digital work that's done on it afterwards. So 
there were the various people had various fingers in that pie as it went along. For me personally, we had we were given um, well, there were seven different versions of it in the Force Awakens, and uh, three different versions of that were the one the kind of the performance versions. There were two versions of trikes with wheels on the back that are removed afterwards that are driven by remote control. And then there's a version um, on rods, which is the one I'm principally involved with, and I have the control of the body and the head on two axes. And the other puppeteer who works with Dave Chapman, um, he has the so I've got pitch and roll on the head, and he's got the yaw control. So we have to work together to make the head move as one. Um, so there's that version. There's the, the the trike, as I said, which is run by Matt Denton, who is the animatronics programmer for the for the whole of the Star Wars saga with all the creatures, and he drives that one around, and Dave does the whole head. And then there's um, the Wiggler version, which is on a plate, and that just sits, and, it, and it, it's got 349, uh, 359 degrees of movement on the body and the head, and it can roll around, but it doesn't actually go anywhere. So between those three different versions, uh, the, the, the sort of different iterations of BB-8, Dave and I were tasked to go and find out what it looked good doing, what it didn't look good doing. We had about a fortnight in a, um, in a soundstage just to play with it. Previously to that, though, we'd um, we'd read the script, and this, a lot of it is in the script anyway. Uh, but there was a point where I did a camera test for the, for, for the crew because they, you never quite know when you have these things what they're going to look like on camera. And this is before BB-8 was even finished. We had him on a little trolley pulling him along. Josh Lee, who is the uh, the engineer that built BB-8, he. Um, he had him on a little wheel trolley, he's pulling him along, and I'm walking along with my hands in my pockets, looking down on him. Uh, and I think that footage shows up in one of the making of somewhere. And I looked at him and thought, well, he's about the size of a dog, you know, a dog or a toddler. And then you sort of think that through. And for me, the dog thing really stuck because if you look at it, Poe Dameron has a dog that he gives something to as his run away. That dog then runs off and is caught and Ray finds a stray dog who is then loyal to her and she takes that dog back to her master, back to his master rather. And if you think of it like that, he's, you know, he's, he, he's feisty, he's inquisitive, he's smart, you know, he, he, he bites if he has to and he runs off if he has to. He's like, it's, you know, there's a lot of intelligence about him. And so with that in mind, um, you can, if you take something like that, something smart like a dog or, or a very tenacious toddler, that wants something and is going to go and get it. And the great thing about the puppet version of BBA, or all the versions of BBA, but with the things we can do with these with these particular puppets, is the difference between BBA and R2D2 is that R2 does a lot of his acting in the sound edit because he, um, if you look at R2 and you see him, you know, Kenny Baker would rock him around and do his stuff, and you would put a certain type of mood in the sounds across that. You would get angry if you know if you put an angry perf sound performance from Ben Burr on there, it would be an angry droid. But if you took those angry sounds off and put happy ones on, you'd have a happy droid, and it was the only difference would be in the sounds. But with BB-8, you can move the head, so you can drop the head slowly, which make him look sad. You can flip it up quickly, make him look surprised. You can cock it to the head, cock it to the side, make him you know look uh, look inquisitive and you know quizzical rather, and we had a lot of leeway to play around with him like that. So we found out, you know, what he looked good doing, what he didn't look good doing. And and I would also do the dialogue on set as well for BB-8. So when they were asking it questions, I would beep back. And so that would, that would really sort of be very, very useful for the actors to know, you know, what kind of performance they were going to get. And, and it would be good to bounce off them. Interesting. I'm glad I'm not the only one that saw the uh, loyal puppy dog uh, personality and BB-8. <laughs> that's the first thing when I saw the movie. That's the first thing I thought. I'm like, wow, he's just like, he's like that loyal dog that always mm -hmm. back yeah. in and do what you need to do and so eager yeah. to please. Yeah, that absolutely. That that was absolutely the intention. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, awesome. Um, do you relate in B to BB-8 in any way? Um, in what respect? I don't. Um, I, mean, I don't know. Like, I think I personality-wise. I mean, do you see yourself in BB-8? Uh, it's got, you know, obviously, you know, performing something like that. Uh, Dave Chapman, as I said, and I, we have worked together very closely for years. So we, ha we, we share a sense of humor and a sense of timing. So it kind of has our timing, if you will, which is quite handy because usually Dave is way over the other side of the set. And so he kind of knows and he also, he, he also physically he can see when I'm going to do something. And we tend to just sort of gel because you don't get a lot of rehearsal on camera. 
So we went away and as, as I said, we did that development for BBA over that, those two weeks and that was pretty much all we had. So you have to come to set knowing what you're doing. So we, we sometimes get a, you know, a couple of, we do get rehearsals, but we, we have to kind of think on our feet and know how we're going to, how, how we're going to make something particular happen. So, you know, we, Dave is constantly, you know, watching me and we, we keep sort of eye contact a lot of the time in the rehearsals, just so we know what, what we're going to do. And so, um, yeah, that, that's, I don't, I don't know, it has my time, but I'm not sure I kind of really relate to it as a, as a being, you know? Right. <laughs> no, that's a, it's, it, it's great hearing how you, how you came across, uh, you know, developing the personality and then working with the other people and, and you created, um, you know, one of the most iconic, uh, uh, beings in, in the new Star Wars universe there. So it's all been interesting how, how this all came about. Um, well, you, you also, um, uh, did the puppeting on the uh, Fords also, that's correct, right? Yes, yeah, there was, again, that was myself and Dave, and then uh, we had Damien Farrell and, and, and Colin Purvis, who are two other puppeteers who worked with us right the way through the, 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 sort of the, 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 new, the new era of movies. And so the Porgs came about uh, because, I don't know, when they went to Skellig, uh, Skellig Michael, there were a lot of puffins, and they thought, what can we do? We can't film this movie with puff puffins around. And so they came up with an idea of putting something over the top of the puffins in post, and as that developed, then uh, again, Jake Ludd Davis, um, he came up with a design for those and they went from being kind of a uh, more of a background thing to you know, being brought more into the story because Ryan really liked them. So there were two of us on each of those pork puppets, one on the wings and one on the body and the head. Um, and I'd have control of the head. I would do the head and the body and the legs and Dave would do the wings on when we were together. And so you could kind of hop them around and it was, they were kind of backbreaking because they're only about this big and you'd be hunched over them. And then we would wear green and they'd take us out afterwards as usual. Um, so yeah, we, that, that was, we had a lot of fun sort of developing those things and, and the different versions doing different things. And, and they were a real hybrid of uh, practical puppetry and digital takeover as well. So there are times when they start off as a, as a practical puppet and then halfway through the sequence, they'll get, they'll be taken over digitally and, the, the, the real puppet will be gone and they'll they'll, they'll fly off whenever they fly away that's always digital stuff oh okay that's interesting yeah. was there a, a different way you you went about you know puppeting uh doing the puppetry on like a droid versus a live being like a fork is there is there a difference well yeah i mean with any of these things you have to make them um true to themselves so with um say for instance with bb8 to start with you'd find out what that character was and what it would look good doing and what it would not look so good doing so i remember at one point we were sort of talking about the nature of droids in star wars and how you know you shouldn't make them too human but then i kind of pointed out that c-3po in the empire strikes back double takes and nobody would ever program a droid to do this you know and star wars has the most human of of, of all the robots in any of these movies in you know it's sort of across science fiction in my opinion um, you know, because we've got C-3PO, who is, you know, this, this, this sort of pretty English butler, and R2-D2, who's a foul-mouthed plumber. And there's just this great, um, this is a great um, double act going on. So we had to find a personality for BB-8 that would be believable, because you wouldn't put emotions into those, into those, cre those, those characters, but we have to show them being sad and being happy. And then when you, when you, when you come to something like the Porgs, you go and you look at birds and we so we watched a lot of sparrows and robins and puffins and all that kind of thing. So well, what do they do? And then the, the nature of the puppet itself will define a lot of the time how these things will work. So you, you shoot a lot of video, you see what they look great doing. And every now and then you find just one little moment. And Neil Scanlon, our boss at, um, in the creature department, he would come in and look at stuff and go, well, that's good. Make, you know, make more of that and less of this. So he's got a really great eye for kind of pulling things out like that, especially when it comes to creatures that are very similar to stuff that you would find on earth because neil won an oscar for babe the uh, the, the film about the sheep pig i don't know if you remember remember that so that oh, yeah, was really yeah. <clears throat> that was very much um a project that neil was really really involved in so when you start to deal with creatures that are similar to ones you see every day you've really got to capture that um that essence of, of reality but when you have something that's a lot broader, say something like, I don't know, BBA or something like Proxima or um, like Rio or something like that, then you, you can have a little bit more license with something like that. 
It's, it's interesting you uh, bring up Proxima. Um, I didn't know this until we, we were talking before the interview, but you were doing the puppetry on, on Proxima also. Yeah, there were, there were, I think, about 10 or 12 of us involved in Proxima. It was a big, big puppet. And um, it, I think it was about 20 feet, 18 to 20 feet high, and it was in a full tank. So there was, again, Dave Chapman um, <clears throat> ran the face for that with, another, with, with one of the mechanic guys called Adrian Parrish. And Dave was doing the dialogue live on set. And myself and Damien Farrell were in the water doing the biggest, the big two arms. She's got these two arms and there's loads of little arms which were animatronic. And that thing, when it came out of the water, it had to have somewhere to go. So it was in a 20 foot tank, 25 foot tank. And it was on a big pole arm. So uh, there was a big there was a big guy at the back. Um, I had it, so he would move, do the gross body movement. And then we would get kind of pulled along in the water and there were guy ropes to make make different bits of it undulate and uh, there was all kinds of crazy stuff going on with that but if it ever did a big swing i would get pulled with it and um the, the, it was coming out as i say it was coming out of a big hole and there was sort of a safety grating that we stood on for most of the time and then we would just digitally remove later on and if it went too far i would go over the hole and get dunked and there was another diver in the water that would just grab me by the scruff of the neck and just keep me above the water so i could keep puppeteering this pole with these arms so that was it was a it was a crazy time, but the water was warm at least. They kept it hot for us. Well, that's good that they they thought of <laughs> keep the water warm. <laughs> yeah. Um, what other Star Wars characters uh, did you do the puppetry on? Oh well, um, I think we did a I did a I did a count up in uh, Pablo Hidalgo got writes these uh, fabulous um, visual dictionary books, and I did a count through, and I think I came up to about fifty nine that I had been involved with somewhere along the line, either in development or filming. So, I mean, through The Force Awakens, some of the notable ones was myself and Dave were the, 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 the bird that was pecking the metal at the beginning when she drives past on the speeder. That was Dave and myself. Um, I was inside one of the dustbin droids that's walking around on Jakku at one point. Um, where else did we go? We did some stuff in Maz's castle. Um, then in Rogue One, myself and Dave again, and Matt Denton, we, we did the, um, the droid that sees Krennic shuttle fly in at the beginning. It just looks around and the little aerial goes up. We did that. Uh, did a lot of stuff through Rogue One in very, just various kind of uh, animatronic faces on, on different bits and pieces. And then for um, The Last Jedi, as you said, Porgs, a lot of BB-8 in that one. Um, various bits and pieces in the, in the casino. Uh, I did the Fathia, the big Fathia puppet, when uh, the, the, the big horse thing. We were involved in both the static version and again, myself and Dave, we, we work as a double act quite a bit. And uh, there was a running rig as well that they were riding on during the chase. That was a big practical version. Um, what else? And then we got to Solo. And I remember saying in Solo that I, I'd done some creature um, creature suit work before. And I remember saying to Neil Scanlon, I'd like to be in a creature suit. And this was during one of the meetings. He went, all right, you can, and he just picked up a picture. And you can be in that one. And it was this kind of um, lizard-faced parrot that you, you see it quite briefly, it pats Lando on the shoulder when, he's, when he wins the first Sabat match. And then it pe appears later on in Dryden's yacht. Oh no, it appears previously to that in Dryden's yacht. We just shot it the other way around, wearing quite sort of fine gear. I like to think that the other one is his kind of country cousin. But uh, that character, that was an amazing set full of creatures again, you know, and, and I was in the head for that. And I had Colin Purvis in my ear directing me. And uh, Pablo actually, Pablo Hidalgo, who comes to set quite often, and uh, he named that after me. He called that Hearing Bearing, which is which is always quite fun to, you sort of enter Star Wars canon if you do enough of this stuff, which is always quite fun. Now you have a Star Wars character named mm -hmm. you do on top of all of this. Yeah, I said that was, you know, it was, that was, that was very kind of him. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite, you know, it's, it's quite an honor to have, have one of those that were named after you, it's fun. Yeah, well, you've really relived the Star Wars life here. Well, they say living the dream is a very overused term, but I remember we, we were out in the desert, Dave and I, in the first, I think about three weeks in, and I remember saying, if I wake up and this has been a dream, I'm going to be angry for months, you know, because it was a real, you know, it was a real thrill. Great. Um, any of your fans, how can they find you online? Uh, you can find me at Brian Hezer, H-E-Z-Z-A, on Twitter and Instagram, and there's a Brian Herring Facebook page with my mug on the front of it. I think that's me pushing the robot up a sand dune. You'll find that. That's yeah. That's where you. That's where you track me down. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! 
I want to thank you for uh, taking the time and helping us out with uh, Rebel Fund and uh, our goal to raise money for uh, UNICEF. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This has been informative. Um, can't thank you enough. And we hope you stay safe. And uh, we hope to see you on the con circuit very soon. That is absolutely my pleasure. It's always lovely um, as an honorary member of the Rebel Legion and the 501st, and I'm not an enjoy builder as well. Um, it, it's always lovely to meet you guys. So if, if I'm ever at a convention, come up and say hi. I normally come out and find you guys anyway. But um, I've been patch trading for quite some time with you guys. And uh, no, I, th I think it's absolutely brilliant the work you all do. So I'm looking forward very much to getting back onto the, to, to the convention circuit to come and see you all again. So please, everybody stay safe and, uh, and may the force be with you. And also with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.